I told Debbie we'd be out by 20 after 5. It don't look like I'm going to make it. We'll be out pretty soon, though. I appreciate y'all being back tonight. I appreciate the words that were said this morning. I'm not going to get lost tonight. I know exactly where Joshua is, but I'm going to study from one book tonight. That's the book of Psalms. That way I can know where I'm at. Tonight I want to look at Psalms chapter 1, all six verses. The lesson is titled, The Truly Happy Man. Let's read together. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaves shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Is there a key to true happiness? We live in a time where many people are bored, depressed, and other forms of unhappiness are rampant. Is there some basic principle which determines success <coughs> in finding happiness? The book of Psalms, with its very first psalm, shares with us a key principle that can ensure people to find true happiness. The very first word, it says, blessed. The word in Hebrew denotes the idea of happiness. And the actual force of the Hebrew can be translated, oh, how very happy is the man. And therefore, this psalm is described as the truly happy man. In this lesson, we'll take a close look at this first psalm and seem to glean the principles necessary for one to be truly happy. The psalm itself can be divided into three sections. The first section describes the blessedness of the righteous man. <coughs> Looking at the first two verses again, we're told of a blessed, the righteous man's character. It said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. So let's look at it first from a negative standpoint. There is value in negative commands or statements. For so much that destroys happiness is the fruit of sinful activity. We ought to appreciate the value of a negative command because it keeps us from going astray. It protects us from harm and misery. Just like a restraining wall on a cliff that keeps us from getting hurt. I don't know if any of y'all have been out in Colorado Springs before. There's a place called Skyline Drive. I went on it when I was about 10 years old. It starts off wide at the bottom, and the farther up you go, it got narrower and narrower and narrower. And as a matter of fact, if your car was so wide at this one point, you could tell they were telling you to turn around and go back down. Uh, at the time, there were no guardrails on the side of this mountain. Oh, you can look down and see the tops of the trees. Uh, I think now they have guardrails up there to protect one from going over the edge. Uh, it was very scary at the time. <clears throat> Therefore, it is said that the truly happy man walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. He does not take their counsel on how to live. He does not listen to the ungodly's advice. He does not follow the advice of those who are sinful. You now we're told to be careful of the company that we keep. I believe it's 1 Corinthians 15, 33, says so evil companions corrupt good morals or corrupt good manners. You don't want to run, constantly run with people who are going to hurt you. 
nor standeth in the path of sinners. He does not linger where sinners are known to go, for the temptation to go with him would be great. Just like Joseph this morning, don't put yourself in a situation where you can't get out of it. You know that hanging around these people is not, is not good, so you shouldn't be hanging around with them. Or you could be tempted to act just like them. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. He does not join himself with those who ridicule and mock those trying to do right. Many Christians are made fun of because they take a stand for the truth. Many people ridiculed and mocked Jesus. Oftentimes sinners do uh, mock and make fun of those who justify their actions. There is Hebrew poetry in this verse. Hebrew, Hebrew poetry is stressed thought rhyme rather than word rhyme where the thoughts are somehow related rather than just the words. Such thought rhyme are often expressed in various forms of parallelism. Here we find an example of progressive parallelism. He walketh, he standeth, he sitteth. This verse may be taken to describe the journey that one takes into sin. First, one going along with the crowd. Then, taking a stand with the crowd. And finally, reaching a point where sinning is not enough, then mockery is added. Now let's look at it from a positive perspective. Verse 2 says, His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in His law does He meditate day and night. Or He studies. It makes Him happy to study God's Word. How many times do we go home on Sundays and put our Bibles on the shelf for a week instead of studying it every day like we should? The source of His joy and happiness is the Word of God. It is truly his delight. Now we can go over to stand in Psalms, but going to chapter 119, and we see many verses that have mentions the word delight in them. Beginning in verse 16, it says, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Verse 24, thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. <coughs> Verse 35, make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Verse 47, and I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. Verse 70, their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. 77, let thy tender mercies come to me, that I may live, for thy law is my delight. Verse 92, unless thy law had been my delight, I should then have perished in my affliction. <coughs> Down the final verse, verse 174. <coughs> I have longed for thy salvation, O Lord, and thy law is my delight. So we can see that studying God's Word makes one happy. Many people act like it's a burden to study God's Word. But he prefers this delight than rather the counsel of the ungodly. Therefore, in his law does he meditate day and night. The word meditate means to moan, hum, utter, speak, or muse. The picture is one of a man reading and rereading half aloud to himself. Another word might be to ponder. This, this he does with God's word day and night, not implying in monk-like existence, but a concerted interest which goes beyond a casual acquaintance. Which it means is that this is something he does habitually. He takes time to do, setting apart portions of each day, both day and night. This truly makes him happy. Now we're told about his prosperity. Verse 3, he said he should be like a tree. This figure of speech is often used in Scripture to describe the righteous. It is significant to those living in arid climates, such as Palestine. So it is planted by the rivers of water. Uh, 
a picture describing a person whose life is rooted in God's Word, from which one receives constant nourishment, that brings forth fruit in its season, depicting a life which yields something worthwhile, providing blessings to himself and others, whose leaf does not wither. A tree with roots near a river is not likely to be affected by drought. So such conditions do not affect the fruitfulness of one whose strength comes from God's word. And whatsoever he does is self prosper. The figure of the tree is now left behind. This is a general rule. Exceptions may occur for reasons which only God knows. But a life of piety which will generally be blessed by prosperity. Or maybe piety will heed God's directions for success in life, and Pilate will heed God's warnings concerning things that waste life. Such is the character and prosperity of the righteous man. He is truly happy and a blessing to others because he abides in the word of God. He also becomes a monument to God's faithfulness and the value of living by his word. So what are those who do not like the law of the word in his word of God, who does not receive the nourishment found in it? Verses 4 and 5 talk about the condition of the unrighteous. So the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The phrase, the ungodly are not so, is more emphatic than in Hebrew. It's more emphatic in the Hebrew. Literally, not so are the ungodly, emphasizing that the wicked are not like the righteous. The contrast is illustrated by the psalmist. He, de he does not even describe them as withering trees, but rather as chaff, which the wind drives away, easily tossed around in the air. The illustration describes a bleak existence. Their life is one of futility, ending eternal separation from God. And their life has no value. It to be blown away and not found, nor to be burned. And their sorry condition portends no good end. The ungodly should not stand in the judgment. I understand this may be a Hebrew Hebrewism, uh, meaning that the wicked shall not be able to maintain himself. That he is obliged to sit or fall down in shame when convicted of his guilt on the day of judgment. And the final judgment appears to be under consideration. It says, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. In all places where there's righteous people, where they're assembled, they will have no place. Where they are assembled to worship God, whether they meet as friends, where they gather together to participate in His favor. But especially in the last day, when the righteous shall be gathered together to receive their reward, it says the unrighteous will not but be there, shall be assembled together in heaven. The sinner has no place. Well, we know that everyone's going to be here on the day of judgment, but it's just they will not have that eternal reward like the righteous will. The psalm concerning the truly happy man ends with verse 6. It says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, and the way of the ungodly shall perish. The Lord knows the way. The Lord knows, suggests interest in, and cares for the person known. One could say God himself goes with such a person throughout his or her life. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. It tends toward ruin. His path becomes less defined. <coughs> <coughs> it itself like a trail that leads into a swamp. Is not the end described for the ungodly a true description of those who go through life bored, depressed, and unhappy? Their lives are listless, with no sense of purpose or direction, and gradually unraveling. Why is it so? Because they do not because they do, they heed the counsel of the ungodly. They do not meditate upon the word of God like they should. But if we desire to be a truly happy man and stand strong like a well-nourished well tree, bearing fruit at all times with the God on our side, and the key to it is to delight and meditate on the word of the Lord um, and not to heed the counsel of sinners. Tonight, ask yourself, in whose counsel do you delight? That which is found in God's word or that which is provided by the ungodly in this world? If you, true, seek true, if you seek true happiness, let the Lord be your counselor and his word be your guide. If you have a need to respond tonight,
Thank you, prayers of the church. Please come. Always stand to sing.